been working our way through the book of Hosea, and we've seen how the picture of Hosea's family is a, is a picture, a symbol of our relationship to God, and how God instructed Hosea's marriage to an unfaithful woman. He gave them children and gave them symbolic names. And we saw the redemptive love that paid the price to buy back his enslaved love. We see now this marriage relationship with its intimacy and with its personal betrayal is a picture of our relationship with God as his covenant people. How our idolatry, our forsaking God for other people and other things is a personal betrayal like adultery. How God's love for us is as intimate and personal as a committed husband. And God is willing to pay the ultimate price to buy back his beloved from the slavery we entered by our own choices. Now the scene is set concerning God's covenant love with his people and that picture of marriage. The scene changes in this book of Hosea, beginning in chapter 4, to a divorce court where the injustice and infidelity is described in detail. In chapter 4 through 10, we see a progression of opening statements, summary of charges, presentation of evidence, an appeal and a pronouncement of judgment. And while we may picture family court, divorce court, as something different with a different feel, in this context, it feels like a criminal court. Because while it is a family relationship, betrayal of the God of the universe, transgression of his law, is criminal. And the book is written as poetry, and so it's not linear in logic, and it circles around and around, hitting on the different elements and details of the story, reiterates accusations and pronounces coming judgment time and again. We see the appeal or half-hearted attempts by the people to reconcile and the ultimate result. The book also mixes metaphors freely. And so we have established the, the symbol of a family and then we see a court, but we also see in these coming chapters uh, agricultural pictures, pictures of farming, family again to pottery, pictures of slavery and prostitution, and also the picture of a stupid donkey. The central issues uh, of the, the accusations of the ultimate problem that, that God has with Israel are summarized really in chapter 4. And while we are looking at an overview of chapters 4 through 10, we're going to focus most of our time in chapter 4 and, and see how the, the summarizing statements there are supported throughout the following chapters. And really, we're going to spend a lot of our time in, in one verse, chapter 4, verse 6, which has a statement that is vital to our understanding. So with that, if you are willing and able, I'm going to read for us Hosea chapter 4. Would you stand with me for the reading of God's word? Hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel, for the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. There is no faithfulness or steadfast love, and no knowledge of God in the land. There is swearing, lying, murder, stealing, and committing adultery. They break all bounds, and bloodshed follows bloodshed. Therefore the land mourns, and all who dwell in it languish, and also the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heavens, and even the fish of the sea are taken away. Yet let no one contend, and let none accuse. For with you is my contention, O priest. You shall stumble by day, the prophet also shall stumble with you by night, and I will destroy your mother. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I reject you from being a priest to me. And since you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. The more they increase, the more they sinned against me. I will change their glory into shame. They feed on the sin of my people. They are greedy for their iniquity. 
And it shall be like people, like priests. I will punish them for their ways and repay them for their deeds. They shall eat but not be satisfied. They shall play the whore but not multiply. Because they have forsaken the Lord to cherish whoredom, wine, and new wine, which take away the understanding. My people inquire of a piece of wood, and their walking staff gives them oracles. For a spirit of whoredom has led them astray, and they have left their God to play the whore. They sacrifice on the tops of mountains and burn offerings on the hills under oak, poplar, and terebinth, because their shade is good. Therefore your daughters play the whore and your brides commit adultery. I will not punish your daughters when they play the whore, nor your brides when they commit adultery. For the men themselves go aside with prostitutes and sacrifice with cult prostitutes. And a people without understanding shall come to ruin. Though you play the whore, O Israel, let not Judah become guilty. Enter not into Gilgal, nor go up to beth -Avon. And swear not as the Lord lives, like a stubborn heifer, Israel is stubborn. Can the Lord now feed them like a lamb in broad pasture? Ephraim is joined to idols. Leave him alone. When their drink is gone, they give themselves to whoring. Their rulers dearly love shame. And wind has wrapped them in its wings. And they shall be ashamed because of their sacrifices. You may be seated. In, in verse 1, we really see the opening statements of this case. God provides the summary of the charges. This is what the main problem is. The Lord has this controversy or this contention with the people of Israel. This is why we are here, why we've come to this place. And it's summarized there in the second half of verse 1. There's no faithfulness or steadfast love and no knowledge of God in the land. They are unfaithful people. They have played the whore. They have committed this spiritual adultery and turned to idols. They are not faithfully loving God. As we've talked about the intimacy of the relationship, we've talked about the covenantal marriage between the people and God and what should happen in that relationship should be this committed covenantal love, this, this rugged commitment kind of love, the love that, that weathers storms, the love that is committed to the beloved. And Israel has not loved God in that way. And there is no knowledge of God in the land. They have forgotten what they knew about God. They have not pursued knowing God in that depth of meaning where we've talked about before that's not just head knowledge, not just trying to amass facts about God, but knowing God and his character, a personal relationship with him. There is not that commitment to knowing God. And it's evidenced by their breaking of the Ten Commandments, their breaking of the law of God. We see the list there in verse 2. There is swearing, lying, murder, stealing, and committed ad committing adultery. They break all bounds and bloodshed follows bloodshed. That sounds a lot like the list on the second table of the law, commandments 5 through 10. And, and as we understand from, as Jesus explains the law later on in the New Testament, it, it, it all flows out of breaking those first two commandments. But I heard a uh, a preacher say one time that you cannot break any of the other commandments without first breaking commandment number one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. Ooh, is that me? What am I doing? So, again, we see as Jesus explains, as we, ooh, hey, hello. As we see here, should I just use this one? Turn mine on. How's that? Good. Better? Still kind of echoey. Uh, okay. Uh, the, the the first two commandments summarize the rest of the law. As Jesus says, on these two commandments, all the rest of the law and the prophets hang. And so as we see as the charge against the people of Israel in the book of Hosea, 
that it's because they have broken those first two commandments, because they have not loved God and have this knowledge of God, that all of these other things flow out of it. That all of the other sins, all, all of the other transgressions of the law, all of the other idolatry, as we've described, idolatry is making something ultimate which is not ultimate, putting anything in the place of God that only God deserves. All of those other idolatries flow out of our lack of belief, our lack of love for God. And chapter 4, verse 6 has this statement, this, this statement which is so profound and summarizing where Hosea the prophet, by the word of God, says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. For lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I reject you from being a priest to me. And since you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget you, my children. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. My people, the fact that, that who we're talking about here is God's covenant people, the chosen nation of Israel. Yes, they've had a, a long history of being broken apart. And this, this as you might remember, this, this book, this oracle, is presented towards the northern kingdom of Israel, who now for generations has been removed from the tribe of Judah. And, and even more than the southern tribes, the, the northern kingdom has had evil king after evil king after evil king, and idolatry following idolatry following idolatry. But still, still these are the people to whom God has revealed himself. Still, these are God's chosen covenant people. And when he says, my people, the implication is they should have known better. These people should have known. They had access to God's revelation, to God's holy word, to the law of God, which describes the character of God, to the promises of God, which you can hold on to when life gets hard. My people should have known better. I've revealed myself to them, and even time and again revealed myself to them. But they perish for lack of knowledge. They are destroyed for lack of knowledge. You see, knowledge or truth is foundational. That, that we, as believers in God through Jesus Christ, as as followers of his word, are not rooted in emotions. We are not rooted and put our trust in God because he made us feel good sometime, because we were moved along by the spirit in, in some setting where, where we explained it to be God's spirit. And maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, but the foundation of our belief has to be and always has been absolute truth. That knowledge that truth is what we are all about. There is an absolute reality. There is a higher truth. There is something bigger that's behind the universe that, that is more true than anything else. There is black and white. There is two plus two. There is absolute spiritual reality. And our foundation is knowledge of God is truth and understanding of God. What we believe our message, the Bible's message, is rooted in what is true about God, about us, about how we should live, about how things work, and ultimately how we can be made right with God. That the gospel message, the Christian message, is a message, not a system. It is a truth, not a way of earning. It is good news, not good feelings. That what we believe, here's what A.W. Tozer said, what comes to our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What we understand, what we think about, the truth about God, and, 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 and what flows out of that as implications of that are the most important thing about us. That I, if I believe that God is all powerful and all sovereign and has is all holy and wants me to be holy then that's going to affect the way that I live my life 
And the way that we can find knowledge of God, the way that we understand the truth of God is how he has revealed himself. That God has progressively over time and then supremely in Jesus Christ revealed himself. And the way that we can understand that revelation, the way that we can know what God says is true, is by reading his word. That here at Victory Baptist Church, we believe that the scriptures are central and foundational to everything that we do. That it is here that you can be led to understand Jesus Christ. That this book is about Jesus and his story of redemption and how he lived a perfect life and died a substitutionary death in our place, place and conquered death by coming back to life and paving the way for us to be with him forever. That we turn to the book. We are people of the book. We believe that all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, Correction and training in righteousness, as 2 Timothy 3.16 says. There has to be a source. There, there's got to be, uh, if there is an absolute truth, there has to be a way to find it that is independent from me. That is independent from what I can come to on my own accord. What, what you and I can, can come to understand just by ourselves. There has to be a source for truth, because we're going to disagree. And if we see anything in the world today, we see these competing arguments for what is true and what is most important and just the diversity of ideas about what is absolute shows us that we've got to find somewhere where we can anchor ourselves, where we can tether ourselves that doesn't come from inside. Because quite frankly, the heart is deceitful above all things. Who can if it was left to me to determine what is true, we would get some bad stuff. We get some sinful, dark, evil stuff. But we believe in God's holy word. Martin Lloyd Jones said this if we do not start on the common basis that the Bible is the divinely inspired, inerrant word of God, then there's no basis for discussion. But if we're talking about what is true, if we don't start with the Bible, then we've gone off course. And we've gone off course. And the people here in Hosea have lost sight of God's word. They have neglected the scriptures. They have abandoned God's law. And they perish for lack of knowledge. They're destroyed for lack of knowledge. Instead, they have turned to lies. As is so easy to do, as so quickly happens in our lives and in our world, we turn to lies and the father of lies. As Jesus, when he rebuked the Pharisees, said this in John 8, 44, you are of your father, the, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. See, when we abandon the truth, when we abandon the anchor of God's scripture and revelation, we fall into lies and deceit. We, be, we come fall prey to the, the father of lies. And we slide, as the scripture paints this picture of becoming untethered from the truth, we see quickly that, that it slides into immorality and insanity that we believe crazier and crazier things. In Hosea chapter 9, a few chapters later, again in describing the charges against the people, Hosea 9, 7 says this, the days of punishment have come, the days of rep recompense have come, Israel shall know it, because the prophet is a fool, and the man of the spirit is mad, because of your great iniquity and great hatred that we move into foolishness and insanity apart from the grace and knowledge of God. Listen to this description. This description is by C.S. Lewis in the introduction to Paradise Lost by Milton. Okay, and he's talking about here the character in the book of Satan, but I think the description fits and is an apt 
description of our times. C.S. Lewis says this, what we see in Satan is the horrible coexistence of a subtle and incessant intellectual activity with an incapacity to understand anything. The doom he has brought on himself in order to avoid seeing one thing he has almost voluntarily incapacity, incapacitated himself from seeing it all. And thus throughout the poem, all torments come, in a sense at his own bidding. And the divine judgment might have been expressed in the words, thy will be done. Satan, he says, evil be thou my good, which includes nonsense be thou my sense. And his prayer is granted. So Satan's great deception as the father of lies is to believe everything that is antithetical to God's truth. To, to understand that, that I can't think the way that God does, but I'm going to make it look like I'm really, really smart. I'm going to work up all this intellectual activity, is what he says, but not really get the point. Not really understand anything of how God works, of the gospel, of, of God's grace and mercy and forgiveness in Christ Jesus. And instead saying, evil be thou my good, and nonsense be thou my sense, and his prayer is granted. If anything describes the world today, it's nonsense be thou my sense. It's like we're flying upside down in our world today. Like a, like a jet pilot who's making maneuvers and, and flying through a canyon and, and then goes to pull up to, to climb into the sky and crashes into the ground because they were unaware that they were flying upside down. That's the way that, that in our world we seem to be going about our lives flying around, making moves, thinking we're doing well, only to crash and burn because we had no idea where we were to begin with. That nonsense be thou my sense is the order of the day. Romans 1 describes it as a debased mind. Romans 1, 28, they did not see fit to acknowledge God. God gave them over to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. Come to believe anything that is not what God says. But instead, we, we need knowledge. We need to, again, be rooted to the truth. If, if we're not going to live according to the lies, if we're not going to perish for our lack of knowledge, then what is that knowledge that we seek? Because a couple things are important about that knowledge. One, it's not, it's not secret knowledge. That it, it's popular in this time, but throughout history, to have this idea that, that comes from this Gnostic idea that there's, there's a secret knowledge that I can discover, and if I can learn it, then it will change my life, and, and, but i got to hide it and not let anybody else know it unless they're good enough, or unless they learn the secret handshake, or, or find the secret password, or, or, or whatever the case might be, that, that we think there's this secret knowledge, and we're going to look for a code of numbers in the Bible to understand what God really meant. We're going to look for a pattern that, that is superimposed on the scriptures by us instead of reading the plain truth of God's word. That it, it's not a secret knowledge. God has revealed himself. God has made it clearly known, as it says again in Romans chapter 1, he has made through his divine attributes, by his power in creation, it is clear that, that God is there. And he has given us his word, and we have access to the holy scriptures that are clear in black and white. Not a secret knowledge. And again, not a head knowledge that's an end in and of itself. If we think, I just need to go and find some more Trivia. If I just learn some more big theological words, if I just if I just dig deep and find some obscure passage that 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 just to gain knowledge, if it's an end in and of itself, then it becomes worthless. And First Corinthians eight one says it's the kind of knowledge that puffs up. If and if we try to amass that head knowledge, we're no better than the demons. Which again in James chapter two says, if you believe that God is one, you do well. The demons believe that and shudder. It's not secret knowledge. It's not knowledge for its own sake, but it's truth that changes us. 
It's truth about God that transforms. It's understanding God and his word in a way that stirs up our affections for him. That stirs up our love for God. John Piper says, The theological mind exists to throw logs into the furnace of our affections for Christ. I want to learn about God because I love God. I want to know about his character because he is my beloved. I want to pursue him and learn what pleases him because I want to live a life for him. Truth that changes us. And again, it's plain in the scriptures that the Bible is all about being made right with God, about how we can please him, how we can love him based in response to what he has done for us, how we can be saved. And the main things are the plain things. And the plain things are the main things. God has revealed himself in a way that, that a child can understand the gospel, that someone with limited intellectual capacity could understand the gospel, that the gospel can transform even the lowliest among us, think about God, it has to be that way. If it, if it was some deep intellectual thing that you needed a PhD to understand, how would God be good? But the gospel is plain. The truth of God is available to us in black and white. And again, as we've already seen, the, the, the abandonment of the truth or, or the believing in the lies leads to insanity, and it also leads to this immorality to increasingly dark and immoral behavior. Hosea 4.10, God summarizes this slide into deeper and deeper sin. They shall eat but not be satisfied, play the whore but not multiply, because they have forsaken the Lord to cherish whoredom wine and new wine, which take away the understanding. Again, Romans 1 talks about how God gives them over, and we see the picture of humanity running towards sin, pushing and pulling away from God, straining towards darker and darker things, and God's judgment is to give them over to their sin. Give them over, and, and like, like, like a parent pulling on the shirt tails of a child who's running away, ultimately he lets go. And the child, child falls face down in the mud. So how, how does this lack of knowledge relate to us? You might be saying that, that well, I, I know the gospel. I, I, I've been transformed by the gospel. I, I already know what's important to know. And while I think that, that, that there is truth to that, there's distinctions between believers and unbelievers, regenerate and unregenerate, there is a sense in, in which we are all unbelievers. Now, follow me when we talk about this, we are, we, we by our very lives show that in many ways we do not believe the truth. That, that by our actions, by our continued sin, by our seeking of other things apart from God, we show that we don't really believe the truth of God's word. We don't really believe that he is better than what sin has to offer. We don't we don't truly believe, and it, we prove it by our actions. Maybe, maybe we don't believe that his grace is enough to, to pay for that past sin, and so I'm going to go to another sin to look for comfort. Listen to how author Jeff Vanderstelt describes it. When I say we are all unbelievers, I mean we still have places in our lives where we don't believe God. There are spaces where we don't trust his word and don't believe that what he accomplished in Jesus Christ is enough to deal with our past or what we are facing in the moment, or what's coming next. We don't believe his word is true or his work is sufficient. I find that I, I hear the word failure in my head over and over. And I often live this way, and I, I think, yes, God saved me in Christ alone, by grace alone, but I should be bringing something to the table. I, I should be further along by now. I should have more holiness in my life. I should have grown more in this area or this sin that keeps 
popping up in my life, and I think that I have to add some works to my salvation. I don't believe that it's truly by grace alone, through faith alone. Or I don't believe that Jesus is going to sustain me when life gets hard, when the pain of life comes, when those unexpected losses and tragedies, when hardship and heartache comes, where do I turn to first? I often don't believe that I can really go through it with him alone. And I need some kind of pleasure or substance or comfort or distraction from somewhere else to get me through this. And I show my unbelief. This is an everyday struggle for us in every moment of occurrence. That, that, that this transformation of my mind, it, as Romans 12 calls us to, is the work of sanctification. That's the growth of a believer, to believe more deeply and truly God's word. To believe it with our lives. To act it out. This is how we grow. This is, this is the work of following Jesus. And let's jump ahead to chapter 6. If you want to follow with me, I'm going to read uh, verses 1 through 6 here, and we're going to take some time thinking there. But 6 says, Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us that he may heal us. He has struck us down, and he will bind us up. After two days he will revive us. On the third day he will raise us up, that we may live before him. Let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. His going out is sure as the dawn. He will come to us as the showers, as the spring rain that waters the earth. What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? Your love is like a morning cloud, like the dew that goes early away. Therefore I have home hewn them by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and my judgment goes forth as the light. For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. At first, the beginning of chapter 6 seems good, like, oh, the people are repenting. They're, they're turning back to God. But we see by God's response here that it was not a true repentance. That it was this fickle, waving, oh, we're just going to do this and God will forgive us. Okay, let's just sacrifice a couple more animals. Warren Wearsby says this, they saw forgiveness and restoration as a mechanical thing that was guaranteed and not a relational matter that involved getting right with God. This formula religion, like getting a candy bar out of a vending machine, you put in the money, you push the button, and out comes the candy. The Christian life is a relationship with God, and relationships aren't based on cut and dried formulas. They thought, if we just do these things, then everything will be fine. God will move on from being upset with us, and we'll just go about our lives. They saw God as a vending machine, I'll go through the motions. And God says, what am I going to do with you, Ephraim? What shall I do with you, Judah? Your, your love's like dew, like fog in the morning. It's gone like that. And what they missed, what, what they missed, it, it found in verse 6 here of chapter 6 and repeated throughout the rest of the Bible, Jesus himself quotes this verse in Matthew 9.13. I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. They missed the heart. They missed the heart. They missed the, the deep and steadfast and abiding love of God. They missed that it wasn't just rituals that God was after. It wasn't just the blood of bulls and lambs that God was after. He was after their heart. He was after, after a relationship with them. You can't just go through the motions, perform the religious rituals without it being real in your heart and expect God to do something. We can't be made right by going through the motions. And we can't depend on God if we don't have that real depth of relationship with him. Now see, I said that wrong. We can depend on God, but we 
when, 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 if we aren't deeply rooted in him, if, if we aren't basing our life on his truth, when life hits, when things get real, are we going to be blown away by every wind and storm? Or are we going to find our identity and strength and joy in him? See, we're prone to look everywhere else but God. If you're following with me, flip again to chapter 7 of Hosea. I'm going to read verses 14 through 16 there. They do not cry to me from the heart, but they wail upon their beds. For grain and wine they gash themselves, they rebel against me. Although I trained and strengthened their arms, they devise evil against me. They return, but not upward. They are like a treacherous bow. Their princes fall by the sword because of their insolence of their tongue. This shall be their derision in the land of Egypt. We are prone to turn everywhere but up. I like that statement. That, that, that is a well-encapsulating statement. They turn everywhere. They return, but not upward. We, we look for comfort in all sorts of other things. And while... while we might be pursuing sin and, and life might come in and hit us and we know there's no comfort there and so we're going to turn from that thing but so often we don't turn back to God we turn to something else we turn to some other distraction some other pleasure some other thing to sustain us we turn every direction but up again here's another quote from C.S. Lewis perfect love we know casts out fear but so do several other things. Ignorance, alcohol, passion, presumption, and stupidity. It's very desirable that we should all advance to the perfection of love in which we shall fear no longer, but it's very undesirable until we have reached that stage. We should allow any inferior agent to cast out our fear. If you're going through something in life, getting drunk will take it away for a moment. Finding some pleasure to pursue might give you distraction for a moment. And that's the way that we often live our lives. We turn every way but upward. We've looked for identity and, and purpose and comfort and sustenance in all the wrong places. And as a result, we've missed the way that God designed us. We've missed what we were created to do. They become like a treacherous bow, it says in verse 16 there. Like, like an instrument, like a weapon that's no longer good for anything. And, and like a bow that's been strung with a loose string. It doesn't even move the arrow. We lose our strength when we don't abide in God. And, and instead, uh, we throw tantrums. We throw tantrums and demand some help, some comfort. Verse 14, they don't cry to me from the heart, but they wail upon their beds. For grain and wine they gash themselves and rebel against me. We throw a fit and cry on our bed and demand food and drink. When we gather together, their, their minds are on food and drink, not God. He had trained them, but in return they plotted evil against them. May we return to God. May we, as a people, be deeply rooted in his truth. May we tell ourselves the truth of his word. May we learn the truth alongside others. May we study it deeply to equip ourselves for the reality of this difficult world. The one who perseveres is... Not the one who knows the most facts about God, but who knows God deeply and is most satisfied in him. May we arm ourselves for the fight. If you know the story of Jesus and his temptation in the wilderness, Jesus begun his earthly ministry and Satan led him out into the wilderness to tempt him and took him up to the high place and, and showed him all the nations of the world and he was hungry and showed him that he could have food and make rocks into bread. What did Jesus fight with? What were the weapons 
that Jesus used to fight temptation. He quoted scripture. He quoted scripture. May we arm ourselves for the fight. May we go alongside the psalmist and say, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. May we be people of the truth. And may it translate into our lives, not just amassing facts, but may, it, may we live out the truth. And that's why as your pastor and you come to me and, and things are getting hard, I'm going to send you to the book. When, when your mother's diagnosed with cancer, when your marriage is falling apart, when you're tempted to fall off the wagon, when your kid's in a car accident, we're going to go to the book and see it there in black and white, that God is good, that his character is true, that his promises are real, that you can hold on to the truth. We're going to anchor ourselves to God's word. God's character and his strength. May we be people of the truth and may it never be said of us that we are destroyed for our lack of knowledge of God. Let's pray. Almighty God, you are good and you are the source of all truth. As you yourself said, you are the way, the truth, and the life the truth that, that, that can lead us to the Father, the truth that can make us right with you, the truth that can transform our lives and sustain us through the storms that life brings. May, may we examine our lives and see if there is wrong things we're believing, insanity that, that we're believing, upside down thinking that we believe, or if there is immorality in our lives and consistent sin which, which proves that we don't believe really your word. May you reveal that to us and then help us out of that. Show us the truth that combats that. Arm us with your scripture to combat that sin and the wrong thinking in our lives. May we be people of the truth. In Jesus' name.